Alcoholics Anonymous describes its famous 12-step program as, quote, a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. Since the 1930s, millions of Americans have tried to cure their addictions using AA's highly religious approach. In her Atlantic feature story, The False Gospel of Alcoholics Anonymous, Gabrielle Glazer takes on AA and suggests that it's time to apply science to the way we treat alcoholism and other forms of substance abuse. She's here to tell us all about it. Take it away, Gabrielle. A few years ago, I set out to research a book about the explosion in U.S. drinking. Americans were buying more booze than ever before. More of them were being hospitalized for alcohol poisoning, and more of them were checking into rehab. Though people typically underreport their consumption, they were even admitting to Gallup pollsters that they'd been imbibing more than in years prior. Today, the CDC says that 18 million Americans are on the spectrum of what's now called alcohol use disorder. When I began exploring how people got better once they developed a problem, I wondered about the endless number of people, particularly celebrities, who seem to recycle through rehab. So I decided to take a closer look at our $35 billion rehab industry. I discovered that nearly all U.S. drug and alcohol treatment programs are centered in the faith and abstinence-based program of Alcoholics Anonymous, which was founded 80 years ago. That seemed to make sense. I knew people in AA who swore by it, said this 12 steps had saved their lives. It's embraced by our legal system and portrayed by popular culture as a surefire fix. But once I started digging into its efficacy, I was shocked. AA is famously hard to study. It's, of course, anonymous. Five of its 12 steps mention God, so its religious components make double-blind, randomly controlled trials all but impossible. That said, some of our best estimates show that AA's success rate is in the single digits. St. Paul psychiatrist Mark Willenbring, who used to direct alcohol treatment research at the NIH, says that anecdotal evidence shows us AA works for the people it works for, and nobody else. <laughs> Lance Dotis is a Harvard psychiatrist who's been treating people with addictions for 40 years. He says the biggest flaw of 12-step programs is that they don't refer people to other forms of treatment when they fail. In AA, when people relapse, they're told to go to more, rehab, more meetings or to stay longer at, at rehab. I didn't set out to challenge the orthodoxy, but it became clear to me very soon that the orthodoxy needed challenging. We have an over-reliance on a method that's been shown to work for just a few people, or a small percentage of them anyway. And we have other options that are far more successful. We're a nation in crisis, and not just with alcohol. We're in the midst of a heroin epidemic that's killing more people than car accidents. So why do we depend so heavily on a system developed in 1935, when our knowledge of the brain was in its infancy? We've discovered a lot about neurology since then. We've learned that alcohol problems affect our brain chemistry in various ways, and we have a whole new set of science-based tools to help people recover. For a piece I wrote in last month's Atlantic, I talked to about a dozen people who'd been through our treatment system for their drinking problems. Many had struggled to make the 12-step program stick. One woman I met went to rehab eight times, each time for a longer period. She said it was like getting a bigger dose of the same antibiotic that, clear, that her infection clearly wasn't responding to in the first place. When treatment doesn't work, People like her feel ashamed, blamed, and usually broke. These centers charge upwards of $50,000 a month to send people to art classes, yoga, equine therapy, and the AA meetings you can get for free. Unlike fertility centers, which are required by law to publish their success rates, rehabs are totally unregulated. They can say whatever they want, and their assertions go completely unaudited.
Most of the treatment is administered by addictions counselors whose main qualification is that they've been through a 12-step program themselves. The rules are so loose, many states don't even require a high school diploma for these sorts of jobs, even though clients can be suicidal or in the throes of a psychotic break. Meanwhile, their CEOs are earning high six-figure salaries. Because AA developed during a time when we knew so little about addiction, it filled a clinical and cultural vacuum. Doctors didn't have an answer for chronic drinking problems, so they and the public accepted AA's belief that addicts were best suited to treat other addicts. As a result, generations of doctors missed out on learning about the new effective treatments that actually do treat addictions. Former deputy drug czar Tom McClellan told me that out of 170 medical schools in the US, last year only 14 even offered a course in addiction medicine. That means that most medical st school students get their exposure to addiction medicine just by observing AA meetings. I decided to compare our treatment system to Finland's, a country that ha also has a big alcohol problem and shares with us a failed history of prohibition. For the past few decades, the Finns have turned strictly to science to treat people with alcohol problems. Students in all five Finnish medical schools take mandatory courses in addiction medicine and are abreast of new treatments that work. They use cognitive behavioral therapy to help people identify their triggers and avoid them. They help people learn how to replace unhealthy behaviors with healthy ones, even if it's something as simple as walking the dog during the period you'd normally pour yourself your first drink. They also include using a host of non-addictive anti-craving medications. The FDA has approved some of them as well, but only 1% of Americans with drinking problems are ever prescribed them. Doctors don't know about them, and many somehow still believe that treating alcohol problems with drugs creates another form of dependence. In July, I drove to meet the late American neuroscientist David Sinclair. He lived on a rhubarb farm outside Helsinki. He moved to Finland in the 70s to study alcohol research. He showed that the brain releases endorphins, or our feel-good hormones, when most people drink. He believed that among some people, the endorphin release strengthens the synapses, the junction between two nerve cells. The stronger the synapses grow, the more likely the person is to think about and eventually crave alcohol until almost anything can trigger a thirst for booze and drinking becomes compulsive. Sinclair theorized that if you could stop endorphins from reaching their target, the brain's opiate receptors, you could gradually weaken the synapses and the cravings would subside. He began experimenting with some drugs called opioid antagonists. He found that when drinkers take a generic drug called naltrexone an hour before they imbibe, the reward of drinking is blunted. I'm not a big drinker myself, but I tried the medicine for 10 days too. I know I'm just an N of one, but honestly, on the first night, the idea of a second glass of wine seemed about as appealing as a shot of Benadryl. By using this protocol repeatedly, the brain relearns how to drink normally. This is standard treatment in Finland where thousands of people use the method in conjunction with CBT and motivational interviewing, a technique that helps people resolve their ambivalence about drinking or using drugs. Unlike the false promises of US rehabs, the method used in Finland is based on rigorous studies that show a 75% success rate in reducing drinking to moderate levels. That's another big difference. In the US, everybody with a drinking problem is assumed to be on a trajectory toward dependence so severe that one day they're going to need a glass of whiskey in the morning just to ward off the shakes. In fact, studies show that only 10% of people with alcohol use disorder are actually in the severe range. Those people probably need pr programs that promote abstinence. But the vast majority of the others can benefit from a range of approaches, including learning to moderate. We have to let people know these options exist, and they do.
in online and in-person settings. A program called Moderation Management helps people avoid their triggers, track, and control their drinking. Another, called Smart Recovery, uses CBT and motivational interviewing to help people make positive changes. Harm reduction groups, including one here in Brooklyn called HAMS, for harm reduction, abstinence, and moderation support, helps people In the 1980s, gay Americans pressured the U.S. government for more research money for HIV. They succeeded, and today HIV is no longer mastectomies. Today, they're offered targeted chemo, radiation, and lumpectomies. The Affordable Care Act provides coverage for Americans with alcohol and substance use disorders, and we can do better by them, too. The time is overdue for all of us to demand treatment options based on the latest science. They deserve it, and so do we. Thank you.